I have a series of questions for you. Okay. So here we go. So you're a social psychologist, right? Um, you know, it's it's <laughs> it's kind of funny. My degrees are I have uh, one PhD in cognitive psychology and one uh, PhD in business administration. Yes. Uh, what I actually do is kind of between social psychology, cognitive psychology, and economics. Okay. Um, so it's it's a great mix, actually. Many companies right now, companies that are trying to innovate and start with new strategies to sell and not only to sell not only within their relationship with clients but also inside companies they're trying to innovate and human resources uh, is starting to be different uh, from what it was uh, since a couple of years ago for example how do you think uh, this kind of research you do can really help companies do that really innovate and change what they're doing so if you think about it uh the basic question is human motivation. It's about what get people to take particular actions, what get people to care, what get people to want to do something. This is what everybody's trying to do, whether you're thinking internally in terms of your HR, you think externally in terms of your uh, customers, it's all about human motivation. And the notions of human motivation from outside of social science, and particularly from economics, are incredibly mechanistic. They mean that people only want to uh, rest and people only want uh, money. I mean, they're very, very simplistic. Uh, it's not that they're worth nothing, but a very simplistic view of human nature. And what social science in general is doing is saying, let's look at the broader set of human motivation. Let's look at all kinds of things that people care about, both in terms of employees and consumers, and let's design the environment internally and externally to take this whole set. So there's no question in my mind that if you want to be successful, in this world, you want to take this broader perspective into into account. Okay, so I've actually read some of your research about motivation, and uh, what the result was uh, was that actually money didn't have uh, such a good effect on human motivation. So, yeah. so um, there is, uh, as Dan Pink said in the presentation where he at, at the TED where he presented your work, actually. Uh, he said that there is a disconnect between what science knows and what business does. When do you think that gap is going to be filled? So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, half optimistic, half pessimistic about this. So, the, the real issue is that money uh, is a motivator, but it doesn't always work in the way that we expect, and it's not always the right thing to do. And this is true both at the low end of the scale when sometimes you can add money to something and make people less likely to work, and it's through at the high end of the scale, where it can also uh, backfire. Now, if you think about it, big companies have a really hard time to change. <clears throat> think about some, some big organization, ask yourself, how are they ever going to learn that something is better to do a different way? They would have to take some of their employees and pay them one way, they would have to take another set of their employees and pay them another way, and in today's legal environment, I don't think anybody would do it because immediately they would be uh, hit with the lawsuit. So who are the companies that are actually doing interesting, innovative stuff from a HR perspective? It's startups. Okay. Why? Because they don't have a history of how they used to do things. And the people who are starting the startup, starting with a small group of people, and they're starting from scratch. And they say, what would get me to want to come to work? Uh, every day and that makes a big difference so think about some interesting practices and um, Google Google gives people 20% of their work time to work on whatever they want yeah. now from the rational economic perspective what would you say what would people do with that time they, they would sit it. by the pool they would sit by the pool Google has pool they have a gym they have really good coffee and fruit juices you would say people would sit there and relax but that's not what people do in fact, when you look at it, people work incredibly hard in this 20% of the time. They do something they're really passionate about. They get their friends who work at Google to come and join them. And not only is this 20% of the time becoming effective, but everything else in the organization is being influenced by that. Because if you have one day a week in which you can do whatever you want and you're the boss, all of a sudden it changes how you view the other days of the week and you care more about the company. So that's kind of one interesting idea for innovation. Um, 
another uh, another interesting thing is Facebook. Uh, Facebook is shifting people around all the time. They give them experience as in other parts of their company. Is this an efficient thing to do from a production perspective? Of course not, because they don't know how the other part of the company works and they have to learn how it works. But it turns out uh, they do learn things and the connection between people is increasing. And, and finally, there's another company I really like called Zappos. Zappos uh, is an Italian, you should know, they're a shoe company. Yes. Uh, they're, they're, an online, they're an online shoe company. Uh, they sell shoes for rather expensive amounts compared to internet shopping, but they have very, very good customer service. Uh, if you get a shoe from them and you don't like it, it's really easy to ship it back. Uh, they're really, really nice. Um, and what they do is they invite new people who want to work in their call center to come for a 10-day training activity. And after these 10 days of training, they come to these people and they say, we really like you. We think you're great. We want you to be part of this family. We want you to work here, but we know that this is not for everybody. So in the next 48 hours, if you decide not to take this job, we will give you $3,000 not to take the job. <laughs> now, you can say, what a strange idea, right? And by the way, they started from $500 and they increased the amount to 3000 over the uh, last two years, last two years. <clears throat> now, why do they do that? The first thing is that if there are people at the edge of the tail that don't like to work there, they don't want them. Because if you have somebody who is not happy and not liking what they do, not only are they not good for the job, they're also influencing the people around them to be not as effective, right? Imagine you and I are sitting in a cubicle and you're not talking nice to a customer there's a good chance I will learn from your behavior as well. But the second thing is what we call cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is the idea that if you behave one way and you believe something different, uh, this is an uncomfortable situation. You behave one way, you feel something else. This, this dissonance, this lack of agreement is uncomfortable. So what do you do? You can't change how you behave, that's set. What you could do is you could change your belief. Right, so imagine you turn down these three thousand dollars, and then you wake up on Monday, and you say, "Why did I give up these three thousand dollars?" And you say to you, you can't say to yourself, "This was a stupid decision. I'm an idiot." You say to yourself, "This must be a great decision, and it must mean because I really love Zappos, and I really want to work there and work well there." So, in a sense, it has a reinforcing element in which you increase your love to the company by reminding people. Now, if you allowed people to take the $3,000 every day for every day they work there, it wouldn't be the same. But the fact it's an exploding offer for a very short time has a big effect on this. And, and you know, this is a very, on the face of it, it sounds very strange. And you could say, would it ever work? And would you ever think that Citibank would do that? <laughs> the answer, the answer is probably no. So I, I'm pessimistic because of the legal structure and I'm pessimistic because big companies are not really doing anything interesting. Uh, I'm optimistic because startups are. You know, uh, uh, HR and salaries is the biggest part of what any company is doing. There's no question that if you wanted to be a more efficient company, the first thing you should learn to do is how to pay and reward your employee. That's the, the most important thing. Um, but companies are really bad at it. They're really not trying enough things. Yeah, that's the kind of paradigm, paradigm uh, where uh, when something works, you don't want to change it. So that's what many companies, big companies, old companies especially, have been doing. Especially here in Italy, there are um, some very old companies um, that have a, a tradition of decades and they really don't want to change because they don't see in what way change could be good but you know you have to understand that the the public is different your customers have changed they're not the same customers from uh, the 1950s you know right. i've seen a, a very interesting um presentation made by matthew gisti from starbucks and he said that all the innovation they've done at starbucks was done in periods of crisis when starbucks wasn't doing very well so not when things were doing great because then yeah. it wouldn't have made sense. So 
So I think that was a very interesting thing to, to acknowledge, actually, because that means that um, big structures need to see that how things are going and how they're doing things isn't working before they actually start considering changing the strategies. Yep. So, you know, the, the nice thing about the experimental method is that you create two conditions and you can see which one works and which one doesn't work. But if you think in a company, when you pay everybody in a certain way, you have no way to knowing if it's working or not working, right? It has to be complete devastation because you, before you figure out. I don't have but, a control group, actually. You can't have a control group. That's right. But, but if companies started becoming more systematic about experimentation, they would see more readily, not just when things are not working, but how we can improve something. So, you know, something can be okay, but just not great. And you would never notice it because you never try to figure out how it works.